Hi, I'm Mike Redwine of the Louisa Project 2027, where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Today we have a special live show. Um, today we're going to be dis discussing the uh, the uh, it's about education funding and race. <clears throat> it's based on what's going on in, in New York State, how things are being funded, how education is being funded or not funded in this case. Um, there's there's a um, there has been a lawsuit. Uh, and there was a lawsuit in 2006 uh, pertaining to how education funds are, are spent. And it was found that that the um, that the state of New York had shortchanged um, uh, children of color and 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 poor poor children um, based on where they live and based on how taxes are supposed to be spent. They had shortchanged them by a great deal of money. I have Jasmine Gripper here with me. Uh, she's a legislative director of the Alliance for for Quality Education, um, and I'm going to let her talk to you about that. Jasmine. Hi, Michael. Thank you for having me on your show. So my name is Jasmine Gripper. I am the legislative director with the Alliance for Quality Education. And our organization started because a group of parents from New York City uh, decided to sue the state uh, when they realized their schools were not receiving enough funding. It took 13 years for this lawsuit called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity to go through the courts in New York. And after 13 years, the courts ruled in favor of the parents and said New York State was violating students' constitutional right uh, to a sound basic education by underfunding our public schools. As a result of this lawsuit, the state was then, uh, the state took it upon itself to enact what they call a foundation aid formula. It was one formula that would be fair to fully fund our schools statewide. Uh, the problem is that lawsuit uh, finished and that remedy was put forward 10 years ago. 10 years later, um, the schools are still owed $4.3 billion in foundation aid. Uh, the state initiated its phase in of foundation aid um, for the first two years after the lawsuit was won, and then the financial crisis hit. And in the midst of the financial crisis, New York State decided to balance its budget on the backs of students. They literally filled in the gaps within the New York State budget by pulling and taking money and cutting funding for schools. So the two years of increase uh, were completely reversed uh, once schools went into the, once the recession hit. And since then, New York has fully recovered from the financial crisis. And yet our schools have not been a top priority for our state governor and our schools are still owed this money. Uh, the majority of the funding, uh, three fourths of it actually are owed to students of color and this this funding would help repair or help close what we have is the opportunity gap uh, now we have record-breaking inequality in new york schools we have our wealthy school districts that are outspending our poor school districts by about ten thousand per pupil uh new york even though it's considered the diverse uh mecca of of, the, of new york and of the state and of the nation we have some of the most segregated schools uh in the country and so clearly new york is not leading when it comes to educational justice and educational e equity for our students. All right. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I, I'm, something we we often tackle on on this show, which is our first show back since um, since last year, <clears throat> is is this um, the issue that the the issue that most schools are funded, the majority of their funds come from from local taxes, and because local taxes are based on, for the most part, they're based, the, these taxes are based on the value of your home, the value of your property. There's, there is uh, inequality baked into the pie because we live in such a segregated society based on policy. And it's, it's just, um, it's just how things are, are, un, un, in, un, are, in, are in, in unequal and, and it creates an, a, an equitable system. So, um, as far as um, Alliance for our Quality Education, what what do you guys what what does your organization do? Just to give some people some background about what what you're doing now uh, to try to uh, try to right the ship here. Yeah, so we are working with parents, students, educators, and uh, legislators who are willing to take a stand um, and commit to fighting for the funding our schools are owed. Uh, we know what works in our schools. Uh, for some reason, uh, some elected officials want to keep telling us we have to continue to experiment. We need to decide what works. We know what works in our schools. We know the funding matters. Uh, money buys resources, money buys smaller class sizes, money buys technology, uh, all things that students need in order to get ahead uh, 
educationally and to succeed in college and careers. And so one of the things that we're doing is always advocating, making sure parents understand how much is owed uh, to their schools, uh, how much is owed to their districts, and let it On the Louisa Project 2027, where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. We just had a break there. Um, <clears throat> we're discussing education, the education budget in New York State, and I'm joined by uh, Jasmine Gripper of the Alliance for Quality Education. Um, we we uh, we we had a, like as I said, we had a short break there. Um, Jasmine gave us some gave us some background. So Jasmine, could you continue uh, what you were what we were talking about before we started? What 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 um, the role that 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 that, um, uh, that uh, Governor Cuomo was playing in all this? Definitely. So Governor Andrew Cuomo, when he was first running for office, uh, really vowed to address the inequality in education funding. And then once he was elected to that office, uh, then began to reverse and step back on his words and his promises. Uh, he started to say things like money doesn't matter in education, uh, which is really surprising considering the fact that uh, for his older children, he sent them to a an expensive private school, and for his younger child who did attend public school, attended one of the most well-funded schools in the state and in the nation. Um, and so when you say funding doesn't matter, who does it not matter for? Students who look like me, our kids don't deserve the funding, is what we see in the systemic racism of, of what's happening in our education funding. And so part of our job is educating parents at where the blame lies and holding our legislators accountable uh, to fully fund our schools and let them know what their educational, uh, what their neglect does to students that uh, a child only has one chance to be in first grade. If they go to an overclouded classroom, if they have a class that doesn't have resources and supplies, you are definitely denying that child opportunity to success. And so it's our job as advocates to call out the governor uh, for every time he's not fully funding our schools. And right now, New York State is in the middle of its budget process. Uh, the governor is literally releasing his state budget tonight as we speak. And what we saw from him from him just a, a week ago is that he laid out across New York State his state of the state address and all things he wanted to do. And he had about 149 proposals to make New York State um, a leader in the nation. And of those 149 proposals, not one dealt with the fundamental inequality in education funding. And so again, we see our governor not taking initiative and not leading our state and not addressing the needs of our students, especially the students who have the greatest needs. Okay, well, that, that's fair enough. I mean, if he's not doing it, he's not doing it. I mean, there's no reason to, to sugarcoat it. So, uh, <clears throat> so at, at, we were, we we're, we we're, as you, as you said, the, um, the budget is being released and being, being discussed as we speak. Um, Assembly member Latrice Walker and Assembly member Alicia Hyman were supposed to join us and they still may join us uh, shortly. But um, have, have you, have you spoken to them about how things are going thus far? Yeah, um, what we have, uh, what we've seen in this last two election, election cycles here in New York State is this wave of women, young women of color being elected to our New York State legislator and what that means for our communities. Um, and so we've had these young women who come in who are not beholden to the system and business as usual, who have really taken a bold stand and says, uh, who come into meetings and say, this is what my community needs. This is what Brownsville needs. This is what Queens needs. Um, and we're tired of our communities being passed up and overlooked and neglected. And so one of the things that these uh, women of color have done is that they once self-organized. They've organized themselves into a body called the Women of Color Committee. And they meet officially in Albany amongst themselves to discuss their priorities and things that are important to them in their community. And as a result of their collective use and them using their voices as one, uh, they actually initiated a petition on the website Color of Change. And their petition is calling on Governor Cuomo uh, to resist Trump and his racist policies. Um, and they actually draw a really clear line between things that Trump is advocating for uh, that's really similar to things that Governor Cuomo has done in the past. And they call on the governor to truly distinguish himself from the Trump agenda. And uh, he can start doing that by addressing education inequality in our schools and fully funding our schools. Uh, the petition started out with nine of these women of color who initiated it. Um, I believe we're up to 12 of them 
who have now signed on to this petition uh, online, we have garnered over 6,000 signatures. Um, I will definitely share the link on Twitter. If you haven't signed on, please sign on to show these women some support. Uh, these are women who are willing to go to bat for the children in their communities. And this is a refreshing change for us to see here in New York and here in Albany. That's great. Uh, I, we'll share the link in the uh, in the in the description when when, when this goes up on when this when this uh, is done on YouTube. So um, one so one of the things that 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 uh, that's that's been impressed upon me by everybody in the progressive world is that how progressive. Well, I'm sorry, everybody in the establishment progressive world about how um, about how progressive did did uh, did, uh, did Governor Cuomo is, um, and you know. Like most of us, most of us on the progressive side, on the on the, it, it's we it becomes incumbent upon us to do our research, and from what I understand, it, it, he's not really living up to that title. Rhetoric does not match reality in New York State. Absolutely. Our governor is great for spewing out these beautiful talking points that sound mm -hmm. great, but when you read the details, when you look at the language, when you follow the dollars, it's completely unimpressive. Um, one great example of this is literally just last week in New York City, he made a claim that to address the issue of children in poverty, because we have an overwhelming number of children in poverty, he wants to increase after school programs for these students. That sounds like an amazing idea. We totally support having an extended learning day for students, especially for working parents and students who are living in poverty. Uh, we did the math. The research showed that in New York State, we have about 1.4 children living in poverty. When we looked at the details of his initiative, he intended to help 22,000 children. We don't have systemic reform when you have 1.4 billion children in poverty and you do an initiative that helps 22,000. And that's where his rhetoric doesn't match what happens. He did the same thing in pre-K. Uh, de Blasio was elected mayor of New York City, uh, went to Cuomo about the state uh, and figuring out a way to pay for it. Governor Cuomo says, you know what, New York City, don't tax your millionaires. New York State will pay for pre-K for all, not just for New York City, but the entire state. Great idea. Everyone knows pre-K works. Is money invested early? Is dollars saved later? It is a great initiative. For mm -hmm. this three or four years later, New York City does have universal pre-K, but the rest of the state is still waiting. 81% of four-year-olds outside of New York City still do not have access to full-day pre-K. So his talking wow. points don't match the dollars and don't match the reality. And so one of the things we're trying to do is make sure if Governor Cuomo wants to distinguish himself as a progressive leader in New York, he needs to make sure that he is taking a stand for our students. I'm so happy to see Assemblywoman Latrice Walker is now joining us. Ah, Mr. Hyman. <laughs> Both of them are together. Hello, ladies. Okay, great. Hello, ladies. Uh, I'm Mike Redwine. Uh, you've gotten some emails from me earlier today. Uh, you know, well, I'm just going to hand it off to you, ladies. Uh, let me introduce you again. This is assembly. These are, these are assembly assembly members Latrice uh, Walker and Alicia Heineman. Um, um, assembly member Walkers from um, from the uh, district from the 55th district, uh, Brooklyn, and um, assembly assembly member Heineman is from the 29th uh, district in Queens. This is the biggest screen. Now. Okay. All right, ladies, please take it away. What, what, what were your uh, impressions about the budget today? The, the one we the one we just got no, um, just wrote down some numbers because we we just found out as the governor was making his um his press conference. So an assembly member Walker asked the same exact question I was going to ask about the amounts that he's put in for foundation aid, and it's it's abysmal. I think it's just mm -hmm. a direct slap in the face to our communities, um, Brooklyn and Queens, and. 10 years is too long to look at these paltry numbers that he's put in the budget for our children. Hmm. And basically what we found was that uh, it's going to be $428 million in, in foundation aid. Uh, mm -hmm. And 50 million of that, 428 million will go to community schools. Uh, so it's not even that it's a full $428 million. Uh, so at this point, you know, we just got to stay committed. Uh, our speaker had a very um, admirable statement that he made to fully fund CFB, and we stand, mm -hmm. stand with him and in order to make that happen. We think that the governor came far short of what was necessary. In actuality, um, we understand that there is a 900, I think it's $61 million increase to education aid. Uh, mm -hmm. However, 
we know from AQE that we need at least a $2.1 billion increase just to get at levels where we need to be. So the push is still on and, and we're in solidarity. Yes, we are. Okay. So um, I guess I guess the next question is, so where do we go from here? Well, like um, AQE has been doing for for the, the fight continues on down this mm -hmm. level because my, my constituents always come to me and they say, you know, what happened to the CFE money? And as a parent advocate before I became an assembly member, that was my question coming here. And now when you're seeing all of the, the red tape that's involved, it's very discouraging when the numbers are given and you want to talk about how we want to fund higher education, we have to make sure we take care of our K through 12. Our, our K through 12. We don't have, Absolutely. if we don't have a sound basic education um, with lower class sizes and, and equitable um, resources in our public schools, how are we going to make sure our children are ready for college? We can't talk about college and career readiness if we don't fund, how, if we don't fund our K through 12 education. And that's a disservice to us to give us um, this amount. When last year, the, the, the gap was fully funded. It was fully mm -hmm. funded. Now, we, we did our part as a legislature to vote for that. Now, we have to make sure we keep the fire. We keep educating our communities. We get the buses up here like AQE has done. The, mm -hmm. mar all, the march to Albany, um, we can't make all of that work go in vain. We have to continuously advocate for this money to come to our districts. Absolutely. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? I'm sorry. <laughs> I second that. I second that motion. <laughs> All right. And also, great. I know the uh, the Women of Color uh, subcommittee of the caucus has a petition that's going around now supporting our our need for more CFE funding. I believe we have exceeded uh, over six thousand five hundred signatures at this point, and we encourage mm -hmm. everyone to push that petition out. Um, to turn that 6,500 to 65,000 uh, or better. So we, you know, politics is not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. uh, we Absolutely. can't continue to sit on the sidelines and, and, you know, talk at the TV and say what folk need to be doing. But we really got to make sure that our, our folk are out here and, and, and really understand the, the effects and, uh, of, of inactivity as we've seen nationally. We're, I mean, okay. we're still here. We're working. We're going right back into session. So we've gotten these numbers, and they're very discouraging. So that just get like um, my, my colleague said, it's not a spectator sport. It's getting this information back to our constituents that in order for us to succeed, we need you up here. We need you. You know, they're talking about already um, giving money to the charter schools. The the, the um, Given about fifty million dollars, he said to was it fifty million dollars to charter schools that are districts that mm -hmm. have a high proportion of charter schools making they sh making oh, no, no, sure they have money. We're taking the restrictions off the ability to raise the tax. ability to raise the cap to give money. So the, and, that, and that's discouraging wow. for for members that you know we have to make sure we take care of our communities. And mm -hmm. in New York City, we're talking about one point one million school children, um, predominantly of color, who deserve their fair share of this money. Absolutely. So, uh, what, what do you? Uh, um, I mean, for 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 us here at the Louisa Project and and at the Progressive Army in general, our our, our view is that um, there is a place for for charter schools, but at the same time, it shouldn't be a drain on the resources for exactly. for uh, there is a place, for right? the for for kids who can't get into these charter schools. So, where do you? Where does your organization stand on that? Say that last part again. I'm sorry. So, where is your? Where you, you all? You, you I, I guess you all agree with agree with us on that. There is a place That's for it. them, right? But not a, not mm -hmm. in the detriment or the drain for uh, for traditional mm -hmm. public school children, right? Well, uh, we know yeah. that the assembly has a, and it, we've introduced a bill as it relates to million, a millionaire's tax. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. we always got to find money to support the initiatives. It's only one pot of money. The budget is only 152 billion dollars. Those has mm -hmm. a lot of money. Uh, we know that the education portion and the healthcare portion uh, takes a, a, a real strain on the amount of money that's left. Uh, we're mm -hmm. not sure what's going to happen in Washington, D.C. as it relates to the Affordable Care Act. So we have no idea really what we need to be holding in advance to fill in the gap as it relates to healthcare in our state. Uh, so mm -hmm. if we can increase the millionaire's tax, we can allow the receipts um, coming in from our tax collection. Uh, in order to fund a number of the other initiatives. In addition to that, the governor's uh, proposal also sets aside $50 million for him to do whatever it is that he wants to do. It's called the, I think, executive, you know, set aside, if you will. But 
we'll see what okay. happens with that. Some people call that a slush fund, but you know, that's just me. Yeah, I didn't say that. That's just, that's <laughs> that was me. That, that was Michael Redwine said that. These wonderful ladies did not say that. That's Michael Redwine being a, a jerk. But um, <laughs> my, I guess uh, the, the, my, my follow up question to, to, to that is uh, as it pertains to charter schools. You say they're li- they're they're lifting the cap on on how much how much how much money can be spent on charter schools. Is that what you said? Is that what it means? Mm, no. So basically, and if I could maybe mm. go on on pause, perhaps we can figure out what some of the language is. Um, but mm-hmm. I do just we, I just want to say we just got so, this. Okay. Yeah, it takes time to analyze this stuff. I I understand. Yes. So hold on one second. Okay. And and the budget bills still have to actually be introduced. Um, and mm-hmm. so those still need to be printed and presented so we can analyze it further so that we're not just going off talking points from the governor's mm-hmm. office so we can see mm-hmm. the details for ourselves. Okay, so uh, we we'll definitely want to talk to you ladies, uh, talk to whoever is available when, 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 once the uh, final analysis is complete. So um, just when, when you get a chance, we will do this again after the, after the analysis, okay? That would be great. I think they're looking okay. at their notes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. No problem. No problem. Hey, I, I, I know y'all want to get it right. Hey, do what you have to do. We're here to help. Let me tell you, but we had, I mean, we were in there taking notes on, on our phones or pieces of scrap paper. So we got, we, it's, <laughs> it's live and direct. Right. Because we don't, we don't, it's not like it, this is not written. So this is, you know, what we, mm-hmm. we just heard. So. Okay, and and I, and I appreciate that, and 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 I I, I appreciate that, and and I, and please, those of you who are watching and listening, please understand this is this is they just walked out of just walked out of the assembly, so just be patient, okay? These the, the <laughs> final analysis will come later, ladies. Yes. Please continue. <laughs> uh, we d- we did also see that there's going to be an increase in rent uh, for charter schools from 29 percent to 39 percent, mm-hmm. and apparently there are these regional limitations on. Um, uh, caps, charter caps, and in terms of, I guess, citing new charter schools in different locations. And mm-hmm. some of those limitations will be released uh, as well. But I guess we just, we'll stay tuned. Uh, remember, this is the, the governor's proposed budget, uh, which mm-hmm. we have not received a full briefing on. Uh, but okay. the legislature will still have an opportunity to present its version of the budget. And uh, so as far as we're concerned, it doesn't really matter until we see um, and we've been able to work together, have our budget hearings, do all the processes and procedures that are necessary for the legislature to come up with its budget. And then, of course, we'll sit down and have the negotiations necessary to, to have a final budget come April 1st. I have to say, I'm, also, I'm encouraged that our speaker, when he talked about his speed things, he talked about the millionaire's tax, foundation aid. And I can't remember what the third one is, but we, the, the assembly has yet to submit our request for the budget. And I think that's important. This is this is what the governor's presented. We have yet to do ours in the negotiations. We're gonna go, we're gonna be going mm-hmm. straight on till midnight, not midnight, four o'clock in the morning, probably on April first or even later. Mm-hmm. So this is this oh, is a, a, a very um, laborious process and now we just have to make sure we fight for what we know our schools need. Exactly. And it's a labor of love. And it we're is. fighting for all kids. We're, you know, we're not out here to separate these kids from those kids. Because at the end of the day, um, mm-hmm. they're all our future. And, uh, Absolutely. and, and, and they are futures in our hands right now. And we do whatever we have to do in order to make, them, make sure that they have all the tools necessary to be successful. Great. Okay, yeah. that's great. Cool. Thank you. All right. We got to go back in. Go back in. And no problem. Right. Thank you so much for your time, ladies. Um, thank you. And hopefully talk to you again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. That, that, was, awesome. that was awesome. They are awesome. They're true <laughs> fighters for their district. I love having them great. in Albany. Uh, and they, they really mean well. And I think... Um, and they, they are there to fight. They're not to have business as usual. They're willing to take a stand against the governor. Um, and I just want to echo one of the things that they said, that the assembly in the New York State Legislature has been really strong consistently uh, in pushing for fully funding our schools. Um, but budgets are negotiated. It's a three, three-way negotiation. Uh, everyone assumes New York is so, so democratic. But the, real, the reality is our New York State uh, Senate is actually controlled by the Republicans. Um, and so uh, it's not always as easy to get things passed. And uh, 
the assembly does work really hard uh, to take a stand against uh, negative policies being pushed mm -hmm. in through the budget, as well as advocating for our most vulnerable communities. And those two women are part of the ones who are on the front lines and stand up for the communities of color and against racial injustice, especially for education and schools. That is, that is amazing. Has um um one of the things that, that popped into my head is at, at one of the things that, that that Bernie Sanders spoke about during his run was uh, doing a speculation tax to fund things a spec uh, on Wall Street. Um, just a, you know, it, it was like a I think it was a point zero three percent tax. It was you know it would have been invis basically invisible to them, but it would have raised billions of dollars. Has have have you have you been talking? And has anybody spoke about that? So we are definitely pursuing uh, different revenue options here in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, as they mentioned, uh, the speaker in the New York State Assembly, as well, well as the governor, I believe, and, and still waiting to see the details in his proposal, are proposing some sort of a change to New York State's millionaire's tax. Uh, so it's actually set to expire in the upcoming year. If our mm -hmm. current tax structure expires as is, our budget will be left with uh, literally billions of dollars in the deficit. Uh, so we cannot allow this to expire. This is not the year for tax breaks for the wealthy. Um, what we're looking mm -hmm. for is a renewing of New York State's millionaire's tax, as well as uh, making it a bit more progressive. And so upping uh, tax increases at the higher end uh, will still keep New York lower than California, but while capturing uh, either two or three billion in revenue. Um, another revenue option we're uh, looking about is the carried interest loophole. Uh, which mm. is something directly for a hedge fund millionaires. It's actually something that Hillary Clinton supported, Bernie Sanders supported, uh, even Donald Trump supported. Uh, we'll mm. see if he'll actually do it. Um, <laughs> and there's a way that New York State can actually capture those funds in lieu mm -hmm. of the federal government enacting legislation uh, to uh, to capture it now. And it's ways we can generate billions of dollars. Um, so there are a few potential revenue options on the table that advocates are looking at uh, to say, we need to fully fund our schools. We need to ensure that healthcare for New York is, is intact. And there are ways to capture that revenue um, and really acknowledging, acknowledging that the inequality gap is growing to record levels and the wealthy have mm -hmm. more than they've ever had and the poor are struggling like never before. And the only way to do it uh, and to really help raise all boats is to tax the, the top earners in some form or fashion in ways that they barely notice so that we can have meaningful change and meaningful uh, life-changing uh, experiences for those at the bottom. Um, and that a little bit from the top can go a long way for those on the bottom. Okay, and, 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 and helping and and this is just me thinking and helping with this if 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 uh governor cuomo is really going really going to run for president this can only help him <laughs> this is the, this this is only this is this can only, there's no this there's no way this hurts him unless he's talking about his, you know a few millionaire buddies who aren't going to fund his his run but but other than that for the most part this is a win for him politically and um, and maybe I'm just naive on that in that particular space, but it just doesn't make sense if you're going to run for run for um, for president in 2020. It, it would behoove you to assure that education is doing well in your country and in your in your state. We we hope we hope that uh, we the hope, governor yeah. we uh, <laughs> the, the joke around New York uh, state is who was the happiest Democrat on election night, <laughs> um, and it was Andrew Cuomo because he now realized with Hillary Clinton uh, not in the White House him as, mm -hmm. as a New Yorker he has a chance to have his eye on a 2020 election um, mm -hmm. and we've seen a change in some of his rhetoric and some of the things he's saying and we're hoping mm -hmm. that uh, we we get a meaningful change from him and he really does what's right to benefit communities of New York and like I said that he's not just giving us talking points and rhetoric but truly enacting policies truly having the money follow the words um, and so we definitely plan on holding him accountable to every talk Talking point, he says, if he's talking about free tuition, we want to make sure that all of the students in New York City, especially the poorest students uh, across the state, have access to free tuition. Um, mm -hmm. And we're not letting him get away with talking points that don't have dollars and that aren't helping the neediest families. Okay. Are you? Are do you? Um. Are, this is. This is. I guess this is kind of odd question. But did, does AQE have AQE have a uh, um a a um, scorecard system like a lot of like like a lot of the um, the lobbyists in in DC they'll 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 like NRA they'll scorecard uh, um a a particular you know scorecard everyone based on on their issues right so but what it, how progressive is he really that sort of thing. 
Uh, we've done a scorecard on the governor before. I think mm. he ended up with a lot of F's and D's. Um, <laughs> not not too Sorry, many. My report card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't done one on him recently. We we can definitely uh, we we definitely want to keep an eye on what he's doing and really mm-hmm. holding him accountable to the things he says. And so maybe doing another scorecard should be something we we do in the near future. Yeah, you, you, um, you'd be doing the whole country a favor for twenty twenty. Just yes, <laughs> just put that out there. <laughs> and I, it's something we need to do on a host of issues. I think the other part that uh, can be a little mm-hmm. bit deceiving about New York is that the governor uh, really plays off having a Republican Senate. And when there's something he doesn't want to do, he just blames mm-hmm. it on the Republican Senate, even though oh, he has the power. <laughs> <laughs> even though he has the power yeah. to get things done. Um, and so mm-hmm. we see things that are really shameful for New York. Uh, one of the things that we have yet to pass is raise the age um, for criminal responsibility. New York and, and North Carolina are the only mm-hmm. two states that still prosecute 16-year-olds as adults. Um, this is shameful, right? Uh, so along oh, with all of the education... North Carolina? Wow. Exactly. <laughs> so along with all of the education inequalities, we have a host <laughs> of other issues mm-hmm. that are that need mm-hmm. to be addressed. Um, and every year, the people of New York get together. Uh, we have a people state of the state and share what the people's priorities are. We have record homelessness in New York right now. We have record poverty for children and for adults. Uh, These systemic problems have to be addressed in a real way for families in order for us to move in the right direction. And right now, um, and like I said, I have to analyze the the governor's budget too, but from what we've seen from him in the past, he hasn't made significant investments in our communities for there to be real change. In fact, we've actually seen a growing of the inequality gap. Okay. All right. Well, I... (laughs) That's that pretty much seals it for me. But uh, he has, he still has four years. He still has four years, and the process <laughs> isn't over yet. We're not in April yet. But um, it, it's good that people are keeping an eye on this. Uh, it's good that, that you folks are, are are trying to assure that that children in need have a have a equal shot at a good education, which is good economically. It's good morally. It's I mean, it's, there's no downside to this. It's not like it's money wasted. So I mean, it, it's I, I'm really glad to see that AQE is on is on is on the is is watching out for for the for the for the children of New York and and the parents of New York and New York itself. New York itself should be New York State itself should be should be should be on top of this as well. All right, so I, I guess that I, I, did you have anything else for us? Did you uh, have anything else you want to talk about? Nope, I think that's it. I just want to make sure people definitely get out there and sign the petition and port and support these women of color we, legislators who are taking a bold stand. Yeah, absolutely, and we, and we'll we'll get we'll put like I said we'll put that in the. Um, in the description of, of, the, of the video. And uh, uh, additionally, we'll, we'll tweet it out once we get it from you and we'll tweet it out and we'll try to get the rest of the, the uh, Progressive Army to tweet it out as well. All right. Okay, all right. Uh, Jasmine, if you if you don't mind, could you let everybody know where to, where to contact you? Sure, they can contact me. Uh, I'm jasmine at aqeny.org is my email address. You can hit me up on Twitter at jazz, J-A-S, gripper, G-R-I-P-P-E-R. All right, great. All right, and the two ladies that were on earlier, uh, Assembly Member um, Latrice Walker of Brooklyn, her her Twitter address is Assembly L Walker, again, at Assembly L Walker on Twitter. And also, uh, um, Assembly Member Alicia Hindman of Queens. Hers is Alicia A L I C I A Hindman H Y N D M A N. All right. So uh, I guess that wraps it up for the Louisa Project. I'd like to thank everybody who, who who stepped in. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, David Grossman, for jumping in here at the last minute and uh, for this request. And hopefully, uh, Jasmine, hope to talk to you and, and the rest of the ladies very soon. And also, I'm sorry, and Zakia. Zakia Ansari, who set all this up. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.